For centuries, humans have been growing alongside our botanical brethren. Our histories have mixed and mingled to bring us modern medical marvels, faded folklore, and everything in between. Of course, in order to understand the plant, we have to start with its roots. I'm M. Grebner Gaddis, and this is Rooted. Hysochiamus niger, more commonly known as henbane, is a member of the Solanaceae or nightshade family. Some of its more famous relatives include belladonna, tomatoes, potatoes, and tobacco. It's native to the Mediterranean, Siberia, and areas of Northern Europe. It was naturalized in Ireland, England, and now can be found all over the world. In the U.S., henbane started in the Northeast, where early colonizers brought it to use in medicines. It has since spread to the Midwest, Southwest, and Northwest regions, where it grows like a weed in pastures, on roadsides, and in waste areas. Henbane is an annual or biannual, characterized by its tall, hairy, and greasy stalks, unique flowers, and horrific smell. It grows well in a variety of soils, but prefers well-draining soil with moderate nutrients and a spot with plenty of light. It produces large, five-lobed yellow-green flowers with distinct purple veins and centers. They bloom in May through September. Its small, green, egg-shaped fruits release hundreds of tiny black seeds. These seeds can remain viable for at least five years, which is one of the many ways henbane manages to spread so prolifically. Here in the U.S., it's considered a noxious weed and highly toxic. But why would anyone want to spread this greasy, gross-smelling flower? What was it used for? And what impact does it continue to have? To find out, we'll have to go back to the Middle Ages. Don your curdles and hold on to your butts. It's going to be one bumpy ride. One interesting thing about henbane is how unpredictable it can be. Different parts and dosages do very different things and can have wildly varied effects on people. This is one of the major reasons it fell out of style. While smoking or absorbing oils from the seeds can make you hallucinate, it can also cause you to vomit, lose control of your muscles, and cause extreme pain. The leaves can increase feelings of pleasure and help you sleep better, but they can also cause gastrointestinal distress and heart palpitations. One of the biggest reasons we know about henbane today is that it was a very potent hallucinogenic, but it was used for so much more than that. We used it to treat anything from toothaches to anxiety and everything in between. Due to its ability to numb pain and help users sleep deeply, it's no surprise that this was a popular go-to for treating aches and ailments of all sorts. Henbane was also used to spice wine and was a main component in beer until it was banned in the Bavarian Purity Law of 1516. This law banned any ingredients other than barley, hops, yeast, and water in the production of beer. Henbane was originally used in the beers we call pilsners today, and was popular not only because of the flavor it added, but also because it made people thirstier when they drank it. Pretty diabolical, if you ask me. The thing is, though, the dosage can be tricky. A mere 10 milligrams of the stuff will kill you, and the dosage size has nothing to do with the potency or effects of the plant. Because of that, Using henbane has always been risky, with tons of accidents and less than stellar party tales. The fact that there's so much room for error made henbane an attractive option for poison, just like its cousin Belladonna. Most famously, henbane is believed to be what Claudius used to kill his brother King Hamlet in Act 1, Scene 5 of Hamlet, where he poured a vial of it into his ear. The result of this was the most literal interpretation of ear curdling ever to be put on paper, and almost instant death. The symptoms of henbane poisoning include rapid and weak pulse, paralysis of the iris, blurred vision, dry, warm, and reddish skin, extreme thirst, hypomotility, or constipation and bacterial overgrowth in the gut, hallucinations, ataxia, the decreased ability to control your muscles, and eventually coma and death. 
These symptoms are most commonly experienced when henbane is ingested or taken at an improper dosage. They can come on suddenly, and once they start, they're very tricky to stop. But how does it work? Well, henbane combines both hyoscyamine and scopolamine, which relax the muscles lining the digestive tract and can impact your central nervous system, inhibiting parasympathetic function and adenosine cyclase. In other words, it slows down your fight or flight response and causes other key things in the body, like digestion and movement, to slow down or stop completely. Henbane isn't all doom and gloom, though. It's important to note that henbane played a huge part in ancient witchcraft. Witches were using henbane to speak with the dead, summon gods, and sometimes even get revenge on enemies. In Greek mythology, it was said that upon entering Hades, the dead were adorned with wreaths of henbane, causing them to forget everything about their lives and to wander aimlessly for all eternity. Oracles were also said to use henbane to communicate with the gods, the most well-documented of these being Pythia, the oracle to Apollo at Delphi, who inhaled an incense laced with henbane to aid in her communications. Additionally, the Greeks often associated henbane with Aphrodite, the goddess of love, and Dionysus, the god of intoxication. In Europe, henbane was used by necromancers in their rituals to raise the dead, and was very common in love potions, poisons, and in other ritualistic spells. Ancient Germans thought throwing the seeds into the sky might inspire rain, and believed that wearing its seeds around one's neck could protect from seizures, numb certain pains, and even assist in shape-shifting. When applied topically, henbane causes hallucinations, releases inhibitions, and generally makes users feel relaxed and euphoric, which is why when peasants wanted to party, they would make something called a witch's brew or witch's ointment with henbane seeds. They would grind the seeds down into a fine powder, then mix them with an animal fat to aid in absorption. From there, they would spread the mixture onto their bodies for a night of fun. The use of these witches' brews is actually what brought us the infamous witches on a broom trope. See, a lot of people reported that henbane seeds, whether smoked or used in anointment, could make you feel like you were flying. As Gustav Schenk described after his 1955 experience with this stuff, my teeth were clenched and a dizzy rage took possession of me. I was permeated by a peculiar sense of well-being, connected with the crazy sensation that my feet were growing lighter, expanding and breaking loose from my body. Each part of my body seemed to be going off on its own, and I was seized with the fear that I was falling apart. At the same time, I experienced an intoxicating sensation of flying. I soared where my hallucinations, the clouds, the lowering sky, herds of beasts, falling leaves we all swirling along. So, obviously that's how we got flying, but what about the brooms? Did someone with a flair for dramatics or a hatred of chores just throw that in for some extra spice? Well, not exactly. Jordans de Bargamo wrote in the 15th century, but the vulgar believe, and the witches confess, that on certain days or nights they anoint a staff and ride it to an appointed place, or anoint themselves under arms and in other hairy places. In modern terms, the best way to topically ingest these ointments was either through your armpits or, well, your genitals. So the story goes that witches would spread some of their special brew on their broomsticks and ride off into the night. And that's the image that has stuck with us ever since really brings a new meaning to defying gravity. Today, Henbane has brought us more than just cheesy Halloween iconography. It's also used in Transcendum Scop, which is used to treat motion sickness, and a 2011 study by Sengupta et al. found that it reduced seizures, body rigidity, and loss of voluntary movement in mice by preventing the generation of hydroxyl radical in the mitochondria of the mice's cells. Today, we're still looking into this impact, but hoping to be able to apply it to use and treatment of Parkinson's disease. So, there you have it. The story of a greasy, stinky, invasive plant, and how the world came to know and love it. While henbane remains to be a highly toxic weed, 
I hope these stories have shown you how it came to be so prolific, and at the very least, given you a fun fact to share at your next party. That's it for this week. Thank you so much for listening. If you liked the show, please consider subscribing and leaving us a review on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or anywhere else you listen. You can follow us on Instagram at rooted.pod. And until next time, I'm M. Grabner-Gaddis, and this has been Rooted. <laughs>